Well, the latest installment in the Star Wars franchise is out. It's a series called Ahsoka. It's based on a storyline that was originally animated. But Disney Plus has brought Ahsoka to life with real actors, including Rosario Dawson. How does it all translate? And are there even enough lightsabers? I'm Talia Schlanger, sitting in for Elamine Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. Okay, here's a bit of the trailer for Ahsoka. Sometimes we have to do what's right, regardless of our personal feelings. If we don't stop Thrawn, everything will be in vain. We have a lot of work to do. Once a rebel, always a rebel. is the uh, first standalone TV series that's based on a character and a storyline from the animated Star Wars world. A lot of fans have been waiting for this moment, for the chance to see Ahsoka's stories from Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels cartoons brought to life. Joining me now are Hannah Flint and Ryan Britt. They have both watched the first couple of episodes of Ahsoka. They've got some thoughts. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. So, Ryan, before we dig in, could you briefly bring us up to speed on who Ahsoka is and the journey that this animated character took to getting her own live action series? Sure. Ahsoka was created in 2008 by George Lucas and Dave Filoni for the Clone Wars animated movie um, and then the subsequent Clone Wars television show. Um, And the idea was that she was the secret Jedi apprentice of Anakin Skywalker, better known as the future Darth Vader. Um, and at the time she was created, um, Dave Filoni, who is now the showrunner of the of Ahsoka um, and one of the forces behind The Mandalorian, had said that George Lucas presented this as a far out idea. The idea that there was this young woman who was kind of a secret student of Anakin Skywalker. Um, so, yeah, she was an animated character who then appeared in, throughout the Clone Wars, uh, Star Wars Rebels and uh, other animated shorts. Cool. So we've got this this far out idea turns into a, a reality on this new series. Hannah, what's the premise of the new live action Ahsoka series? So yeah, so this is a you know continuation from the Mandalorian uh, set after the events of Return of the Jedi. Um, and so Ahsoka Tano, Rosario Dawson. So she's no longer a Jedi, but she seems to be gallivanting around the galaxy, trying to prevent uh, the reemergence of the Empire. And she's particularly searching for uh, Grand Admiral uh, Thrawn, uh, who is heir to the Empire. Um, and so yeah, it's basically about trying to find it and facing off against some um, naughty uh, Sith red lightsaber wielding baddies. <laughs> Fighting off the baddies. The stakes are very high. I mean, the stakes are the entire galaxy from from what I understand. So classically high stakes. Um, the first two episodes of Ahsoka dropped earlier this week. The reviews have kind of been a, a mixed bag. Uh, Ryan, what do you love about what you've seen so far? Well, I'm an entertainment editor um, in my day job at a a website called Fatherly, which is for parents. And so I write about TV and film there. And I am the daughter. I'm the father of a six-year-old daughter. So I love that there's three female leads on a show and there's not a big deal being made of it. Um, So I love Sabine and Hera and Ahsoka. And I love all the lightsabers. I I like what the show represents for Star Wars. Cool. And anything uh, you think falls short for you in the series so far? I wish it wasn't a story about another space map. Um, That was a little frustrating to me. I felt like we've kind of seen that trope. I worry that Star Wars is sort of stuck with uh, a quest to get a thing to take you to another thing. Um, So that was a little frustrating. Oh, interesting. Hannah, you're kind of nodding along here, I see. What about about you? What did you love and what kind of fell short? Well, it's so funny because I thought about it. I was like, oh, The Force Awakens. (laughs) That was kind of like the plot. Um, I, you know, uh, like Ryan said... Love the female leads. I love that we, you know, branched away from the white brunette lead trope. You know, we've got a bit more diversity here. Mm-hmm. Um, I love that we kind of explore more of the galaxy. You know, I think these series are really opening up. And I understand that, you know, Ahsoka was the Padawan to a Skywalker. But I do like that we're moving beyond that kind of saga. Um, I love the Loth Cats. I always love it when they introduce a new uh, creature. The Loth Cat. Can you say for people who are hearing this for the first time and are about to see it on every shelf of every store come Christmas time? Can you explain what a Loth Cat is? It's kind of like, yeah, basically a cat that's got really tall ears and it's native to Lothal, where um, where we get, see in the first couple of episodes. Uh, that's where Ezra Bridger, who's a character who is part from Rebels, who's also someone that we might find uh, when they locate Thrawn. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's really, mm. really cute. Uh, it is cute. <laughs> so cute. I want to play a clip uh, from the series now. This is Ahsoka talking about walking away from, from the Jedi and her mentor, Anakin Skywalker. Have a listen. Mentoring someone is a challenge. I bet your master found you difficult at times. Anakin never got to finish my training. Before the end of the Clone Wars, I walked away from him and the Jedi. Just like I walked away from Sabine. I'm sure you had your reasons. Sometimes even the right reasons have the wrong consequences. That's a moment from from the new Star Wars live action series, Ahsoka, starring Rosario Dawson. It's interesting to hear the tone of her voice there. She has this kind of like, I don't know how to describe it. She she has this like command that is very peaceful and very, I don't want to say flat because that sounds like a negative word, but it's just very like straight, straight ahead. Could, do either of you want to speak to like to her, her performance in the series? Mm. I mean, it's very different um, from the animated things we saw when she was very young. And I kind of love the fact that, and, it, and, and Ryan, forgive me, what's the name of the, is it Ashley Eckstein? Ashley Eckstein, yeah, yeah, you got yes, it. Yes, who voiced Ashley it. Eckstein. And she's got a very kind of like typical cartoony sort of voice that really bubbly. suits that kind of, yeah, bubbly. Whereas this, I kind of, you know, it kind of reminds me of, you know, how like Top Gun Maverick, we saw Tom Cruise playing Maverick, who is seen things he's been in some battles he's world weary Mm -hmm. and I like the fact that with this performance that's where we see Ahsoka she's been through a lot I mean it's quite subdued the tone you know there's been you know losses grief trauma the things they're going to so I kind of like the fact that you know she's matured and kind of grown up that's in yeah go ahead we got a little Ahsoka doll in the mail um, that I gave to my daughter that has her saying, may the force be with you, in Rosario Dawson's voice. And it is very different than what we're used to, but I kind of dig it. My daughter keeps pressing it, and it's just this very, like, may the force be with you. Like, she's telling you, calm down. The force will be with you. It's really cool. <laughs> you, you kind of buy it from from I, Rosario right. Dawson in that yeah. way. In that way. Yeah. I want to yeah. talk a bit more about the difference between the animation and the live action. I mean, uh, this all started with a cartoon character, as we've been been talking about. And we know that sometimes things can get lost in translation from animation to live action. Ryan, how how do you feel? Like, do you feel like anything was lost for you in the in in the translation? Yeah, I think that Hannah actually kind of touched on it, is that there is a bubbliness to the Ahsoka character and an, an, and an enthusiasm that is justified in the show, but it lacks some of the goofiness of Clone Wars and Rebels. And I and I think that sometimes that goofiness, like with uh, Chopper the droid, I know a lot of people like that on Ahsoka, but I found it a little bit like, oh, I kind of liked it better when it was an animated droid. Um, and so I thought that some of the, even Ezra, the hologram of Ezra, I felt like some of his goofiness was... That's the essential thing. There's a humor and lightness to Rebels and Clone Wars, which is strange because they're about these huge intergalactic conflicts and violence and betrayal and all these things. Mm -hmm. But I do feel like that there's an inherent goofiness that feels a little tamped down in these first two episodes. And I'm hoping that some of that lightness and I hope that Ahsoka gets to lighten up as a result. Yeah. We've been using so much so much uh insider Star Wars jargon here, like the, the characters, the universe. This is a complex world um that's built through the Star Wars franchise. Hannah, I'm wondering for you, uh how how accessible does Ahsoka feel in in that respect of like, you know, maybe bringing in people who aren't super fans into the fold and making something mm-hmm. entertaining for them? Well, you know, Star Wars is very much known for its exposition. Even in that clip, we have Ahsoka contextualizing where she's been, what's going on. So they kind of like do make sure that everyone knows what's happening, which I don't know, maybe that's kind of a can be quite boring, especially if you already know this situation. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but I also feel, you know, Star Wars at this point, like it's for kind of fans. People are invested in it. It's kind of like the Marvel Cinematic Universe jumping in. <laughs> in phase five and not going back to the beginning it might be a bit difficult and i suppose that's the difficulty with having these kind of like web narratives and into these series and films that all kind of connect with each other so i wouldn't say it's the most accessible um maybe maybe do a quick read up of what you need to know before watching ahsoka <laughs> before tuning in the ahsoka primer okay just in the last yeah. in the last minute that we have ryan briefly uh anything else you hope to see as the rest of the series unfolds Yeah, I hope to see more of Ahsoka's relationship with Sabine explained because (laughs) people might assume that their falling out happened in Rebels, but it didn't. That's a new backstory that the show has sort of dropped on us, that Sabine and Ahsoka had this beef. I would love to see that explored more because it's new. It's a new storyline. And so it's something that looks backwards and forwards at the same time. 
Cool. Well, it's still early days, and I know fans uh, can't wait to see how it goes. I appreciate you both for unpacking some of this for us. It's been fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hannah Flint is a film and uh, TV critic and author of Strong Female Character uh, based in London, England. Ryan Britt is a writer in New York who's written a number of books on sci-fi culture. You can catch new episodes of Ahsoka Weekly on Disney+. Plus. I'm Talia Schlanger, sitting in for Elamine Abdul-Mahmoud. That's a little bit of music by Leela Gilday. It's a song called Both Eyes Open. Leela is a musician from Yellowknife who had to evacuate her home because of the wildfires. She's among the tens of thousands of people who have been displaced from their homes in both, both the Northwest Territories and in B.C., when the fires started spreading, Leela packed up her camper van, and she drove for hours and hours and hours with her parents and her dog. Leela and her family are safe now. They're staying in Edmonton. But the journey, as you can imagine, was emotional, and it got her reflecting about what matters the most. I talked to Leela yesterday, and she started out by telling me how she and her family are doing. Uh, we're doing much better better than we were last week. <laughs> Although in some respects, things are just now starting to uncoil and we're starting to feel the emotion of, um, you know, it's not so much the rush of trying to evacuate and trying to um, take care of basic needs, but now it's uh, the unprocessing all of the emotions that come with watching from afar as uh, people, um, you know, fight the fire that's so close to our um, beloved towns and um, yeah just really wondering what the future holds so it's um it's unprecedented for us and it certainly for me um, you know this is the first time that I've been in a situation like this so I think I'm just I'm dealing with it minute to minute and I'm relying on my my husband and and my family to help uh, support support all of us together. If it's not too difficult, I want to know a bit about the moment that you realized that you had to leave your home. Um, when did you start packing? From conversations that I had with neighbors and friends, I had suspected we would be evacuated a few days before it happened because even though the city of Yellowknife was initially saying, oh, we'll put people in different parts of the city if other parts of the city are at risk, I just thought... That's probably not what's going to happen, given the nature of um, what happened in Fort McMurray a few years ago. Um, so I started packing about three days before um, the evacuation notice was called. And I convinced my parents to leave. My husband had been on a trip, actually, before, and he was trying to fly home. And his flights getting kept on getting cancelled. And that was the moment where I was like, OK, I have to go. And my parents said, we're going to wait for our flight Sunday. And I said, no, I can't go without you. So they packed up and uh, we, we drove down um, together. How did you decide what, what you were going to bring with you? <laughs> That's a really weird thing. So, you know, I'm laughing about it now, but at the time I was distraught. I was like, how do you, of course, you know, like yeah. I brought my wedding dress, but I didn't bring you know, this other beautiful cape that my mother had made for me with fox fur. And I, and I brought like my music equipment and my, um, all of my, like I brought one guitar out of three. <laughs> I'm sure those other guitars are really upset. But <laughs> yeah. How do you even decide, look at three guitars and decide which one to bring with you? Like that's. Oh, yeah, But so it took me a, the full three days to kind of figure out things and whether it was going to be an air evacuation or whether I was going to go by road. And at the last minute, I threw one of my Junos in, but not the other one. And then <laughs> I was just laughing today about, for some reason, I thought, oh, it would be a, such a good idea to bring this giant garden spade, like this giant shovel. And so I have no idea why my husband found it in the camper the other day. And he was like, why did you bring this? And I just, I don't know. It was 
Yeah. Anyway. I mean, it's impossible. It like all the emotions of that and the adrenaline and trying yeah. to decide what's impo- what's what what is emotionally important mm-hmm. to you and then what's necessary for your survival. I yes. can't even imagine what that's yeah. like. Um, it really kind of pulls into focus what's important and what's just possessions. And in my, you know, long conversations with Daryl, he reminded me, this is, you're coming, all that matters is that you're coming, we're going to be together and we have each other. And and that is the most important thing. All the rest is just possessions. Daryl, your husband, yeah? Yes. Yeah. So you're, I mean, you're an artist and, and in the music that you make, you often draw on your connection to the environment and to the land. Would you describe that relationship a little bit? Yeah, for for me and uh, for in a Dene worldview, because I'm from the Dene nation, um, we're not say we're not separate from the land and water. We are a part of our environment, and we rely on it for sustenance and um, health and spiritual connection. You know, my family, we still harvest and um and do traditional activities even though we're not um sustaining ourselves 100 percent from those traditional ways we still feel that powerful connection and i i think especially for den and day it is such a beautiful territory and vast and it, you feel so small when you're you know out there on the land and um how how deep that connection runs um that that it's made my way made its way into you know, all of many of the themes that I write about are that connection and um, how, you know, we've taken as Indigenous people, we've taken up uh, our place as stewards of the land and water. And so my music has also been influenced by, for example, the protests that um, I've been involved in or that my, I've seen my family and friends take part in to defend the land and water for generations to come. I want to play a bit of a song of yours that relates to to what you were were just saying. Have have a listen to this. That's a bit of your song, Rolling Thunder. Uh, mm-hmm. I can see your face. People on the radio can't. Your face looks um, so <laughs> full, like full of emotion right now. What, what are what are you, what is the song about? And and I guess what are you thinking about as you're listening right now? Yeah, that song was inspired by the protest at Standing Rock. Um, you know, protesting against the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, but really, it was, and I was so inspired to see so many of the people from different nations gathering. Um, to support the people at Standing Rock and to um, to to move in solidarity with their protest, um, but really it was from a lifetime of witnessing these kinds of protests uh, of our people putting their lives and their bodies on the line to gar- to be guardians of the land and water, um, and to defend against these massive resource extraction projects that um, really have. Um, you know, the bottom line money and greed. Um, one of our really well-known chiefs, James Washi, talked about the Dena Nation being like a great river flowing. And and we can't see that we're a part. We can't see all of those thousands of years of people that we're still a part of. But, and we can't see those children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren that we will be a part of. But we are our Dena Nation, our people. And that connection is like that great river flowing. So um, that song, it's just about about the strength um, that people can draw from that and the necessity to be, to take on that role as guardians. How does that connect with what you're experiencing now? Um, you know, I feel... I feel really strong about uh, the necessity to address our climate crisis um, and, and change how we live. And, and this is, you know, being an environmental refugee now um, along with thousands of other people, I'm certainly not the first and I won't be the last. And it's, um, you can see the, the result of, uh, you know, it's only been 150 years of the industrial revolution and, and, and we've already, push the planets 
to its edge. And, um, you know, she'll be fine. Our earth will be fine. But how will we be able to live on this earth in balance with it for many more generations if we continually push the push that needle forward and um, think only of ourselves and our own benefit and our own profit? It's a really tough thing to think about losing my home, but in a, which, you know, the firefighters who are working so diligently right now assure, assure us it's not going to happen. You know, we're, we're going to defend Yellowknife. And, um, but in terms of the long term, our home is, is not just our houses. It's not just the dwellings that we have. Our home is this planet. And how can we shift so that our children are not continually living through crisis events like this? I know it's hard to talk about. Um, just as we close off here, as a musician, as an artist, how do you see the role of music in, in healing here? I think music is extremely important um, and can be kind of a guiding light for messages of hope, messages of change. I was thinking of uh, Bridge Over Troubled Water this morning. <laughs> and I've listened to many songs to help me get through um, this tough time. Um, and that's what we do as humans, as and also to connect. As an artist, I always strive to be a part of that. My music is, you know, I... I've made five records. My next record is all in Dene languages. Um, so that's uh, something that for me, that's a part of my healing journey as a, an Indigenous person reclaiming language. But that connection with the water and the land and our relationship, talking about that in music and, and uh, singing about that in music, I think it's able to shift people's minds and hearts and able to heal people in ways that we desperately need. I so appreciate you talking to us today. Uh, I know it's hard and, and it means a lot. Uh, we're thinking of you and, and sending you solidarity and hope, hoping for the best. And is there, um, is there a Dene, uh, a, a wish in, in a Dene language that, that we can give to you or that you would share with me now as we close out? No, I just want to send out my prayers and my thoughts to uh, all of so Tine, all of my family and Masi Tsiniwe um, for, for this way of life. And I'm thinking of uh, all of the people who are working so hard on the front lines to help us and to help our communities here as well. I'm really thankful for that family. So Masi Cho to, to everyone um, for, for listening to this. Um, I, I know it's not, um, it's difficult to to listen to people going through this, and it maybe seems like I'm um, like ringing the same bell, but I'm feeling it in a way that is different than I've ever felt it in my life, and I'm really thankful to be able to share that story. So, Masi Cho. Thank you so much, Leela. Take good care. Too. We are brilliant. Ten million years of atoms glow Shining through the deepest night Trust the stars to bring you home Though you're out there on your own Ancestors guide you to the light That's a bit of Leela Gilday with a song called Giants. Before that, you heard my conversation with Leela uh, she's among those who had to leave their homes in the Northwest Territories to escape the wildfires. And I just want to say again how grateful I am to Leela for having the courage to talk to us. It means so much. Sending her and her family and all those affected uh, solidarity and care from us here. For the latest on the story, you can go to cbcnews.ca. And that is it for the show today. I'm Talia Schlanger sitting in for Alamin Abdul Mahmoud. I'll see you next time. <laughs>